Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Paychex third quarter earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during the question and answer session. You may register to ask a question at any time by pressing the star and one on your touchtone phone. You may withdraw yourself from the queue by pressing star and two. Please note today's call will be recorded and I will be standing by if you should need any assistance. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Mr. John Gibson. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Todd. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for our discussion of the Paychex Third Quarter Fiscal Year 23 Earnings Relief. Uh, joining me today is Efren Rivera, our Chief Financial Officer. This morning, before the market opened, we released our financial results for the third quarter ending February 28th. You can access our earnings release on our Investors Relations website. Our Form 10-Q will be filed with the SEC within the next day. This teleconference is being broadcast over the Internet and will be archived and available on our website for approximately 90 days. We're going to start the uh, call today with an update on the business highlights, um, and then Efren will review our financial results and outlook for fiscal year 23. We'll then open it up for any of your questions. As you saw in our press release, we delivered solid financial results for the third quarter with total revenue of 8% and adjusted diluted earnings per share growth of 12. Thanks to the outstanding efforts of our employees, we completed a successful selling and calendar year-end season with strong sales volumes and revenue retention for the quarter. We continue to see a stable macro environment and demand for our solutions. Our unique value proposition is clearly resonating in the market. Small and mid-sized businesses continue to show remarkable resilience, as seen in our job index the last two months, as they contend with a constantly changing labor market, inflation, increasing regulations, and rising interest rates. Before we get into the third quarter results, I want to take a minute to address the recent volatility in the U.S. banking market as a result of two highly publicized bank closings. We have no cash, restricted cash, or investments deposited within Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank. And we've met all client fund obligations related to employee payment services and remittances to applicable tax or regulatory agencies. We continue to monitor the situation and believe that our existing client funds held cash cash equivalents, and investment balances are more than sufficient to meet all client fund obligations. We remain ready, as we were when the crisis was unfolding, to help businesses and their employees whose payroll processing or direct deposits may have been impacted by these bank closures. Paychex has a longstanding track record for being a stable place for customers, employees, and investors during all types of macroeconomic situations and crisis, and we demonstrated that once again. The selling season was positive in terms of both revenue and volumes in a very highly competitive environment. In particular, demand has remained strong for our HR outsourcing solutions, though as we've reported in prior quarters, we continue to see a trend of client shifting preferences for our ASO model over the PO model. In the third quarter, we saw revenue retention remaining near record levels and normalization of uncontrollable losses at the very low end of the market. The focus and investment we continue to put in our high-value clients is making a difference in the customer experience. In addition, the advisory assistance we provide our clients is critical in these challenging times. Our retention for our HR outsourcing businesses, both ASO and PO, stand at an all-time record high year to date. PO and insurance solutions continues to show lower health insurance attachment and enrollment inside those clients that are attaching. This is specifically impacting our PO in the Florida market, and the softer rates for workers' compensation insurance continue to impact the property and casualty part of our insurance agency. We expect these trends to continue early into the next fiscal year and normalize as the year progresses. Paychex is uniquely positioned with a continuum of solutions designed to help businesses in any (coughs) macro environment. We help them recruit and train employees, gain access to capital, 
and provide valuable benefit packages such as insurance and retirement. Through our innovative technology, compliance, and HR expertise, we are here to help businesses drive efficiency within their HR processes, which therefore frees up valuable time for them to focus on going to business. Competing for and retaining employees remains a challenge for today's workforce. And I want to commend Congress and the President for signing the recent Secure Act 2.0, which will introduce a range of new opportunities for businesses looking to introduce a retirement benefit and make their employee value proposition more competitive. We have begun to launch campaigns to educate the market on the Secure Act 2 and continue to position Paychex as the industry leader in retirement plans that we are. We are working on strategies to leverage our strength in this market and capitalize on this opportunity in the, in the years ahead. As higher interest rates and disruptions in the banking system have both impacted the cost and access of capital for many small and mid-sized businesses, we have fully embraced this challenge to help them out by proactively assisting our clients and prospects with attaining financial assistance available to them through non-traditional financial uh, partnerships and through government programs such as PPP and the ERTC program. We continue to see strong demand for our full-service ERTC solution. Many of the businesses we've helped are leveraging their new financial flexibility to reinvest in new solutions, uh, such as a retirement plan uh, or one of our integrated HCM technologies. Recently, our ERTC service was recognized with a Stevie Award for helping businesses obtain critical financial support. In uncertain times, people look for stable, trusted advisors to help them succeed. I am proud that we've recently been uh, recognized as one of the most admired, one of the most ethical, and one of the most innovative companies by several prominent and respected brands. We were named one of Fortune's most admired companies in 2023, and for the 15th time, we were named among one of the most ethical companies in the world by Ethisphere. This is a select group of companies that show exceptional commitment to ethical operations, compliance performance, and government, governance and risk practices, including strong commitments to ESG and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, inclusion. and today, we are announcing that we have been named to Fortune's list of America's most innovative companies for 2023 due to the innovation we've shown in our products, processes, and culture. These awards are the result of the dedication of our 16,000-plus employees who daily are supporting our clients and helping them succeed and doing business the right way every day. Very proud of the team, and I'm very proud of Paychex. There's no question that we are a well-managed and stable market leader that people can depend on. We have a long-standing track record of being there for our customers when they need us most, and we continue to be well-positioned to help them through the HR challenges they are facing and whatever comes their way in the future. Now I'll turn it over to Efren, who will take you through our financial results for the third quarter. Thanks, John. Good morning to everyone on the call. I'd like to remind you of the customary things I remind you, that during these conversations we're going to talk about forward-looking statements, Items like EBITDA, non-GAAP measures, please refer to our press release for more information on these topics. I'll start by providing some of the key points for the quarter and finish up with a review of our fiscal 2023 outlook. Total revenue for the quarter, as you saw, was eight per, grew 8% to $1.4 billion. Total service uh, revenue increased 7% to $1.3 billion. Obviously, we're benefiting from uh, increase in, uh, in interest rates. Management solutions revenue increased 7% to $1 billion, driven by additional product detachment, HR ancillary services, that's largely what we've discussed previously, our ERTC product, and price realization. We continue to see strong attachment of our HR solutions, retirement, and time and attendance products. Demand for our ERTC service remained strong and contributed approximately 1% to revenue growth in the quarter. Demand for this product, along with our internal execution, have continued to exceed our expectations while ERTC has been a tailwind, and we expect demand to continue into 
fiscal year 24. It will eventually become, will eventually moderate and become a headwind as we progress through next year, next fiscal year. The insurance solutions revenue increased 6% to $321 million, driven by higher revenue per client and growth in average worksite employees. The rate of growth was impacted by factors previously discussed, including lower med- medical plan sales and participant volumes, along with a mix shift to ASO, as John uh, called out. We expect these trends to normalize as we progress through fiscal 2024, meaning a little bit more of a balance between PEO and ASO. Interest on funds held for clients increased significantly to $35 million in the quarter, primarily due, as you know, to higher average interest rates. Total expenses were up 8% to $769 billion. Million. Expense growth was largely attributable to higher headcount, wage rates, and general costs to support growth in our business. Top income increased 9% to $612 million, with an operating margin of 44.3%, a slight expansion over the prior year period. Our effective tax rate for the quarter was 24.3% compared to 22.3% in the prior year period. The prior year period included a higher volume of stock-based comp and stock-based comp payments and the recognition of a tax credit related to our development of client-facing software that uh, generated the difference in rates. Net income increased 9% to $467 million, and diluted earnings per share increased 8% to $1.29 per share. Adjusted diluted earnings per share increased 12% for the quarter to $1.29 per share. Let me click, quickly summarize the results for the first nine months of the fiscal year. Performance has been strong. Total service revenue increased 8% to $3.7 billion and total revenue was up 9% to $3.8 billion. Management solutions up 9% to $2.8 billion. PEO and insurance solutions up 6% to $877 million. Op income increased 9% with a margin of 41.8%. Adjusted net income and adjusted diluted earnings per share both increased 12% to $1.2 billion and $3.31 per share. Our financial position remains strong, as you can see, uh, with cash, restricted cash, and total corporate investments of more than $1.6 billion, total borrowings of approximately $808 million as of February 28, 2023. Cash flow from operations, again, solid for the first nine months, was at $1.3 billion and was an increase from prior driven by higher net income and changes in working capital. We've had our quarterly dividends at $0.79 cents per share for a total of $854 million during the nine months of fiscal 2023, or 12 months rolling return on equity was a stellar superb for 47%. Now, let me turn to our guidance for the current fiscal year ending May 31, 2023. Our current outlook incorporates our results for the first nine months and our view of the evolving macroeconomic environment. We have raised guidance on certain measures based on performance this past quarter. Updated guidance is as follows. Management Solutions revenue now expected to grow at or slightly above 8%. We previously guided to a range of 7 to 8%. PEO and Insurance Solutions outlook is unchanged at growth in the range of 5 to 7%, although we anticipate it to be towards the lower end of the range. We expect Q4 PEO and insurance solutions growth to be below 5% due to the factors that we've talked about through much of the year. Interest on funds held for clients is expected to be in the range of 100 to 105 million. Total revenue is expected to grow approximately 8%. Other income expense net is now expected to be income of 10 to 15 million, obviously due to higher interest rates. Remember, we net um, interest income there with our expense on the debt. Adjusted diluted earnings per share is now expected to grow in the range of 13 to 14 percent. We previously got into growth of 12 to 14 percent, so we tighten the range, obviously one quarter left. Guidance for margins and effective tax rate 
are unchanged, but we do anticipate being on the higher end of the range for operating margin and the lower end of the range for effective tax rate. We currently are in the middle of our annual budget process and are working on expectations for next fiscal year. As you know, this is challenging for a number of different reasons, not the least of which are uh, expected uh, outcomes in terms of interest rates and also macroeconomic environment. We'll provide final guidance for fiscal 2024 during fiscal 2023's fourth quarter earnings call in June. However, let me share some of our preliminary thought process around fiscal 2024. On a preliminary basis, we believe that the exit rate in the fourth quarter is a decent approximation for total revenue growth for 2024. This should result somewhere in the range of 6 to 7%. And again, we got more to do there, but um, just giving you what our thought process is at the moment. And it's heavily dependent on what we think will happen with interest rates during the year, and at this point our, our assumptions are conservative. Management solutions is expected to be lower as a result of moderating ERTC revenues. We called that out last year. It didn't happen. It actually went the other way. We do think it's going to happen um, next year. And then PEO and insurance revenue growth is expected to trend higher as we progress through the year with moderation in some of the headwinds we have experienced this year, primarily around insurance attachment and also, as we called out several times, a mixed shift to ASO. We remain committed to improving margins, and we anticipate that operating margin will expand at this stage in the range of 25 to 50 basis points for fiscal 2024. Of course, all of this is subject to our current assumptions, which can change, especially if there are significant changes to the macro environment, which at this stage we are not seeing. I'll refer you to our investor slides for on our website for more information. And now let me turn the call back over to John. Thank you, Efren. Uh, with that uh, now being complete, uh, uh, Todd, we'll open up the uh, call for any questions people have. Thank you. At this time, if, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press the star and one on your touchtone phone. If you need to move, remove yourself from the queue, you may press star 2. Once again, to ask a question, please press star 1. Our first question comes from Kevin McVeigh with Credit Suisse. Hello, Kevin. Great. Okay. Hey, John. Hey, Efren. Hey, um, congratulations. Just really, really strong results here. Um, I don't know, John or Efren, maybe, and I know it's preliminary, Efren, but the, the 2024 looks – you know, pretty similar to 23, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of cross currents uh, from a macro perspective. Uh, you know, and, and you folks tend to be pretty conservative. Maybe help us understand some of the puts and takes. Is it maybe there's a little bit more pricing, um, and just any base underlying assumptions around unemployment? Because again, just really really nice outcome. We're just trying to understand maybe maybe that a little bit more. Yeah, let, let me let me. Uh, I'll let John talk a little bit more to kind of what our, our, our thinking is from a macro perspective. But Kevin, just to, to kind of address some of the um, higher level um, assumptions that that go into the plan. I called out the fact that <clears throat> ERTC is uh, not going to be the headwind. I'm sorry, the tailwind that it was this year. We called that out last year, but it's definitely going to happen next year. Or I should, wouldn't say definitely. I will say I have a, we have a very high, uh, high degree of, um, uh, of belief that, it, that we won't see it. However, you're going to see that more in the second half of the year than, than the first half of the year. So um, that's the first thing, thing I'd say. If we, if we look back at where we started this year, we were getting a nice macro uplift from employment as we started the year. That, that seems to have run its course. It is not going the other way, but at this stage, what we're seeing is that there's been a pretty significant moderation in terms of um, in terms of employee ads, and that's happened as we progress through the year. So, so those two things um, those two things are are head, will become headwinds as we go through the year. Interest rates, I called out. Um, 
the first half of the year, I think we've got some sense of where we at, so of where we're at. The market does too. What is really hard to understand is what what happens in the second half of the year and whether we start going uh, going in reverse on interest rates. We're taking steps to to position the portfolio to be able to to deal with that. If that's what happens, but uh, no one knows uh, there now. That's all the stuff that's headwinds. Now, um, positive. We think HR continues to be strong. We think, as John pointed out, we think retirement continues to be strong. And we think that HCM continues to uh, uh, to uh, proceed well. We think PEO, which has been a little bit of a tailwind to growth this year, um, um, it does uh, does better next year. The insurance business, although we call out. Uh, PEO, uh, a lot of the uh, moderation on the growth rate in PEO insurance coming from insurance, we think that starts to improve as we go into next year, uh, and then we have the normal uh, level of cost discipline in the business that drives uh, drives the results that we're anticipating in in 2024. So that that's a a broad uh, overview of how the numbers were put together. I'll talk, uh, let John talk uh, to macro and, and to any other parts of the the business we, we need to call out. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, Kevin, uh, keep in mind that we, we certainly see the efforts of and, and really expected to see some moderation. I mean, we, we don't expect another four and a half, you know, basis points increase in interest rates, and we don't expect the type of hiring that we saw from the, you know, it's hard to believe that the great resignation was just last year, <laughs> a year away. So, you know, certainly our, we, we've had the benefit of staffing up, but we're not seeing any contraction moderation. In fact, you look at our job index, um, which has been a great indicator of kind of small business health. Um, and and what, what we've seen in both January and February that we've reported um, is actually an increase in the index. And, and we really have not seen that uh, through all of this fiscal year. So these are the really first two months where we've seen an increase in the index um, and also saw some moderation in wage inflation as, as, as well. So we're certainly not seeing it. We haven't reported March yet, but I can tell you we continue not to see anything there. Demand for our products, the HR products, the um, the online uh, products that we're offering, the HCM products, uh, the 401K is, effort, is, is really, really strong. I mean, we had a strong sales quarter in the second quarter, and the third quarter was actually better than that, even in a relative basis, you know, quarter to quarter um, from, from prior periods. So, we're seeing good demand and, and, and what I would say moderation and stabilization. We're certainly closely watching um, all of the indicators, but we're not we're not seeing anything. You know, we've got a very – the other thing I would point out on a macro basis, there's a lot of noise in the system. And, you know, I think it's important to say we have a very diverse client base. Um, and, and I think it's fair to say paychecks, we're, we're more of a Main Street small and mid-sized business company. We're not we're not the sil- Silicon Valley. We're not focused on one particular vertical or, you know, we're not heavily weighted here or there. And so we, we tend to represent what's going on on Main Street. And I don't think Main Street small business owners have been reckless in hiring or reckless in spending or able to spend more than they make. Um, and, and so, again, they've struggled through this, and, and we've been helping them to get through it. So our retention has been strong as well. And particularly, we're accounts in our in our um, in our HR advisory um, products, both PO and ASO, again at record levels. So we have a good degree of confidence that our that our value proposition is resonating with our current clients. Um, we still think there's a ton of opportunity inside our client base uh, to provide them uh, further assistance. And while we've seen a tilt towards ASO versus PO this year, I always look at it this way: those ASO clients are paychecks clients. And we'll be talking to them again next year uh, about whether or not it's the right time and whether or not we've, you've got the right benefits offering that now meets their needs. And we're certainly doing a lot of work there uh, to try to make sure we've got the right continuum of insurance products to meet the market conditions for small businesses today. So um, I feel like, look, this labor challenge that we have is not going to go away, and, and I don't think the complexities of, of hiring people is going to go away. And I think that bodes well for how we've uh, positioned ourselves, both from an HCM perspective, our technology is driving efficiencies, it's helping people manage remote workers, um, it's helping them uh, attract uh, workers, and, and quite frankly, our HR advisory services are, um, 
are paying big dividends. So I hope that gives you some color of what we're seeing. Super helpful. I'm going to get back in the queue. Congrats again. Okay, thanks. thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Tokett with Evercore ISI. Thank you. Uh, good morning. If um, good morning, Efren. Uh, good morning, John. Um, just to dig into the uh, fiscal 24 guidance a bit more, could you uh, walk through some of the underlying drivers of management solutions revenue growth for next year um, in a little greater depth? And in particular, um, if you could let's say start with the critical year-end selling season, which you've just gone through. You've indicated it was strong. Um, you know, if you could kind of walk through kind of what, what parts of the bookings were particularly strong within your client base, you know, small end like sure payroll versus uh, kind of more of the core, um, you know, uh, payroll processing business. And then in addition to that, if you could comment on your expectations for client revenue retention next year uh, and also for pricing. Okay. Let me, let me break it into two pieces and then we'll uh, let John comment on the selling season. So, uh, David, uh, look, you, uh, the, to, put, <clears throat> to put the revenue plan together for management solutions, um, um, I, I, I'd say you, you, you gotta, you, you've got to get – several dimensions, um, reasonably right. Uh, you know, the first is obviously what do you expect from a client growth perspective? And John can talk to, to what we saw during the uh, during the um, selling season, what I mean is unit growth in terms of sales. Um, the second part is what do you expect from a pricing standpoint too early to talk exactly what we're going to do, but uh, those two components both, um, client growth and also um, and and also a pricing are, are part of our uh, are part of our assumptions going into next year. You want to get the right level of um, product attachment, continued growth on on the ancillary products in the in the bundled suite, including time and attendance, HR administration, and then. Uh, increasingly within management solutions, retirement and HR drive a lot of growth. And we're assuming strong years in, in both of those products, partly on the retirement side, uh, based on what, what John said. So you put all those together, uh, and uh, that, that forms the basis of our thought process around management solutions and then PEO um, and uh, insurance. We expect to grow faster uh, than we've seen um, this year. Uh, in part because of some of the headwinds we, we feel will abate as we uh, get into next year, although that may still be evident in, uh, in Q1. Um, you, you, you frame the question correctly in the sense that if we come out of the selling season and we haven't felt like we've hit some of our objectives, it becomes a little bit more challenging to put the plan for 24 together, but John uh, called out the fact that we thought we had a uh, uh, good performance in the selling season. We obviously are not going to give you percentages at this point. We, and after Q4, we give you a lot of detail about client base, et cetera. And we'll we'll talk about that. But I'll let John uh, talk to what what we were seeing during the selling season. Yeah, no, I, I, I think David, the key point was is is we had both strong uh, revenue production, new revenue production, and good volume production. Um, uh, across the core business, and then really just continue to see this accelerated level. I mean, we were growing the HR, our HR businesses were growing a good, healthy clip before the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, uh, we started to come out of it, they accelerated. And, and we're, we're really seeing strong uh, growth there, strong growth in retirement services, our online services, time and attendance. Uh, the other uh, uh, bundles that we're offering, uh, retention insights. We're just seeing a lot of traction uh, in, in our products and services, and we saw it in the third quarter. And I said the third quarter was a step up from the second quarter, and we felt pretty good about the second quarter. So, um, And it was a very highly competitive environment. I would, I would say there's a lot of aggressive uh, competitors out there, and I, th and I think our products and, and our sales team did a great job um, executing. Uh, also, uh, the other thing I feel good about in that, in that quarter is you know, we do, we saw a lot of our business, over 50% of our new clients come to us from strategic partnerships. 
and we had a good year-over-year increase there. And, again, I think what's going on there, not only is our products and services resonating, but I think people that are advising clients are beginning to put a preference on, hey, if I'm going to advise my clients where to go, maybe they need to be in a nice, safe place uh, where I don't have to have worries about whether or not their employees are going to get paid. So um, I, I think I think that's also helped us in the third quarter as well. Thanks for that. Just uh, pivoting to um, the float, Efren. How are you yep. positioning the float, you know, if the Fed is almost done raising short-term interest rates? So uh, that's an interesting point, David. I, 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 uh, I wonder whether they're almost done raising short interest rates. I, I tend to agree with you, but I'm not so certain about it. Um, but, but, you know, the lever you have there is what percentage you have long-term versus what percentage you have short-term. And where do you lock – where do you lock long-term rates in over a period of time so you can manage uh, what happens uh, on the downside of the cycle? So um, we're, we're starting to extend duration now because uh, we're, we're of the conviction that, uh, that, uh, that interest rates seem to be getting close to some sort of peak. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, my... Uh, my prognostication skills on this are not uh, are not anything anyone should take to the bank, but I do think from a from a portfolio management perspective, it's probably better to start going longer now, whereas we were shorter earlier in the year. Understood. Thanks so much. Yes, Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ramsey L. Asal with Barclays. Hi, thank you very much for taking hey, my question this morning. Hey, hey Efren, can I ask you to drill down yeah. a little bit in terms of the factors that are giving you confidence that the insurance side of PEO will, will improve next year? Just curious yeah. about the drivers or sort of reasoning behind that, that expectation. Yeah, um, so two things, Randy. Um, it, it, it's interesting. It's been an unusual year in the sense that we've seen softness in insurance inside the PEO, and we've seen softness in insurance, particularly healthcare insurance, uh, in our in our agency. Um, you know, I, I, I'd start with the kind of obvious um, point that um, at some point people do need health insurance, and at some point um, as, uh, as clients grow within the PEO, as we add more clients, we're going to get more healthcare attachment. What's happened this year is that in the PEO in particular, you, you, you have renewals that occur in the fall, and then you have renewals that occur uh, at the beginning of the year. And if in that cycle you don't get what you expected, you basically have to wait for some period of time before you start all of that process all over again. So we, we as we went through the year, uh, in, the, in the first half of the year, thought, okay, well, we're going to come out of the year with a, a robust, um, uh, insurance as we get to the end of the year, it, it was better, but it wasn't what we uh, what we expected. On the on the agency side, um, it uh, it's uh, it's been moderating as we've gone through the year, and we've gone through cycles like this where it seems uh, attachment is uh, is lower, and then it picks up. So part of it is. Uh, almost a mean reversion phenomenon that that we think uh, will will occur. But the second part is we put a number of different initiatives uh, in place that don't bear immediate fruit, but we think will bear fruit as we go into uh, into next year. One thing that's really interesting. Final point on that, John, just to highlight something John said, um, which is. This preference for ASO versus PEO isn't a permanent preference for many clients. Eventually, they'll want a PEO solution because they want the benefits bundled, and we're expecting that we're going to see more of that as we uh, as we head uh, into next year. So, um, while PEO performance, I would just highlight this, PEO performance has been lower than what we anticipated during the year, it's still been growing um, uh, at a at a decent clip. Uh, it's uh, being somewhat attenuated by uh, the insurance business, which has been um, very, very sluggish through the year. 
Yeah, I, maybe I, w- I would I would add to that. I think it's important to understand that you know, particularly on the insurance uh, attachment side in the PO, remember that's a lot of pass through revenue, not a lot of margin. Um, but it's a big dollar number, so a, a, a small percentage change in any direction has probably an overweighted impact on the revenue in the PO, right? Um, and so, you know, extra one percent or two percent, and then another one percent or two percent. Um, participation within the base, I think, is is critical. And to Efren's point, you know, you you have this opportunity to reset your insurance portfolio every, every open enrollment, and you're hoping that you have the right portfolio of cost and and the type of plans that people can afford and they want to gravitate to and what they're going to do. And that cycle comes up every fall and into the into the winter. So certainly, you know, we're taking a lot of data. We're doing a review of every market for the PO and looking at our health insurance lineup, making sure it's competitive. We're taking um, and and, and affordable uh, for clients. We're talking to our clients. We're already in the process of beginning to reset that and talk about that reset. So we're we're confident that we'll we'll have the right lineup and the right right opportunity. And then as Efren said, you know, historically, um, most of Paychex PO sales really prior to our acquisition of Oasis was coming from upgrading ASO clients into the into the PO business, a lot of inside the base. Um, now it's it's far more outside the base, but we still have that capability inside the base. So we think there's additional opportunity inside our client base to upgrade them to PO, um, and that not only increases the revenue, but it also increases the lifetime value um, uh, of the customer um, to us, so it's the right thing to do for the business, and we'll be looking at plans to do that as we go into next year as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. Let me sneak one uh, follow-up in. Yeah. Called out uh, higher revenue per client as a driver in the quarter, uh, and um, I'm just curious over time, have you seen the kind of overall growth algorithm of the business shift more such that that higher rev per client metric is sort of more more important? I guess the underlying question is, do you expect sort of ongoing gains there to sort of persist, or is it was there something a little more lumpy about it that we should be aware of? Uh, no, for sure. I mean, if you look at, if you look at um, the, uh, if you parse all the data, I'm not sure you, you get it from all of the um, public disclosures, you get pretty close. Um, you've seen persistent growth in uh, in revenue per client. So I think we've been very skillful at uh, finding new opportunities, both with product attachment, but also um, the ability to create new products and services within our client base to drive that revenue higher. So yeah, we can we can talk about an algorithm that's about units and uh, and price, or we can talk about a an algorithm that's really around revenue per client. And revenue per client has become more important certainly in the last five years. I I, I think it's important we have to keep in mind you know we're at, we're at stage where we're driving more value to the customer, and and both through our technology as well as our advisory services. And that value uh, is, is driving retention, it's, it's, it's driving pricing power, and it's driving an openness um, to add additional products and services um, over time. So the, the old traditional model we've always had, which is, you know, we, we've always been able to drive price increases over time to, to cover our cost increases. We've been able to go into the base and drive attachment. I would lay on top of that. Because we focus so much on the HR value proposition and driving customers up our kind of value continuum, that the other benefit we're seeing here is revenue retention. And now they're looking at us as their trusted advisor, and they're saying, I want my 401K with Paychex. I want my time and attendance with Paychex. I want my other digital offerings from Paychex. I want my insurance from Paychex. That was very helpful. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Nicholas with William Blair. Hi, good morning, guys. This is Daniel Maxwell on for Andrew today. Um, Sort of similar to the last question, uh, but specifically uh, on WSD growth in the PEO and ASO client base, if you can break apart uh, 
how much of that is coming from existing clients versus new clients and attrition. Um, and any color on, on why there's been a preference for ASO over PEO and, and the reasons you expect that balance to normalize? Is that just coming from uh, increased confidence in, in upselling to PEO, or, or is there anything else in there? Yeah, uh, Daniel. So um, we've seen healthy growth in w, WSEs across ASO and, uh, and PEO. We don't separately break them out, but both have been growing. So um, we're seeing um, positive results on, on that uh, on that side of the equation, splitting it out between new ads versus existing base. Uh, the reality is that because the existing base is so large, it dwarfs the impact of, of new ads uh, from a, um, a WC perspective, especially when you consider losses. So, so we've, we've seen good good growth on WSEs that makes us, as John said, more positive about the general value of our HR advisory services, both across ASO and PEO. I'll let John talk to um, the shifting preferences in a given year between ASO and PEO. Um, yeah, yeah, Daniel, I, I think that what, you, what you're saying is, and again, some of this is just speculation on our part, but when you see um, clients that had our insurance and we go through enrollment and where they had 25 employees that bought the insurance, now they have 22. Um, or you see clients that had your insurance in the PO and, and decide that they no longer are going to have insurance or offer insurance for their employees. I just think you're in a position where, given some of the uncertainty, people are being cautious on off, of adding a benefit. Now, it's interesting. They know they need to have benefits to attract and retain employees. So 401K is doing very, very well. It's a lower-cost benefit. It's a lower commitment. And now when you take the SECURE Act, too, you know, technically, if you're a 20 to 50-man uh, company, a uh, person company, um, you now can basically get a 401k set up and have all of the setup costs and the, and the annual costs covered uh, through tax credits. So those are things they're adding, but the, the health insurance, because of the size of the expenditure and the fact of the matter is, is once you start offering it, it's a, it's a pretty long-term commitment you're making. I, I think there's a degree of, of hesitance to that. And, again, as I said, I think there's more we can do in going out and looking for more innovative product sets that gives access, affordable access, uh, to health care for our employees and our, and our teams are working on that as we go through the new enrollment. But, again, the issue you'll have there, that's going to be enrollment, you know, when we get into the fall uh, of, of, of this calendar year and into the second quarter uh, of our physical, fiscal year. Does that help? Yeah, that's helpful. And then uh, just generally on capital allocation, um, anything on the attractiveness of buybacks going forward or uh, any M&A opportunities that have become more attractive in, in the last few months in the pipeline? I guess, look, with respect to buybacks, I think we, we've talked about what our, what our philosophy is in general. Um, and uh, at this stage, we're evaluating a range of opportunities from an M&A perspective, and if the right opportunity, I'll let John talk to, to that, what we're looking at, but if the right opportunity uh, comes along, we obviously have the dry powder to be able to make something happen. Yeah, I think, I don't think our position's changed on this. I think the market conditions are changing and have changed, and um, I, I think we're going to continually uh, – be on the lookout for opportunities that accelerate um, our position from an HR leader and 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 a technology leader, and and continue to position us as a leading digital HR uh, human capital management provider. So um, I would say I've seen some we've seen some valuations starting to come down. Um, I'm sure the recent disruptions in the financial markets may create additional opportunities. And, and as Efren said, we stand ready. Um, uh, if the right opportunity comes around um, to pull the trigger. It's not that we haven't wanted to do something, uh, but we also are not going to overpay for something. So we're going to be uh, – you're going to see the same financial discipline you've continued to see from paychecks. Um, we believe that the market conditions are more conducive uh, to us moving forward on the m and front, but we'll see if that actually transpires. Thanks a lot.
Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Samad Samana with Jeffries. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, um, maybe one, just as I think about that, that comment about the number of new customers coming through strategic partnerships, um, how should we think about maybe how that impacts kind of customer acquisition costs? Those tend to be slightly larger, smaller, more profitable, less profitable. How should we think about where you're acquiring the customers from and what the impact of that is to the financials? Uh, so I wouldn't think anything about it. I would just really more commonly that's been paychecks for 50 years. Uh, you know, f- over 50% of our new clients have always come from strategic alliances we have. And we're, we're a respected partner with uh, uh, the association of independent CPAs, um, and and so they've always been a big source of ours. Um, it doesn't do anything to our cost of acquisition. I just think um, you know they filled it certainly during the selling season. Uh, we saw a good uptick in, in how they were referring paychecks over other options that they have. That, that was my comment. Okay, great. And then as we think about the the bookings in the quarter, anything to call out between uh, the different kind of customer sizes? So think about it as a very down market, maybe more micro customers versus your average customer size. It's just any trends or, or pockets of strength or weakness? Well, actually, what I would say is, is we have good strength, I think, um, uh, you know, across the board. And actually, you know, what I would tell you is that we actually saw um, a little more strength up market, not just the small startup ones and twos and on the digital side, which is, you know, during the pandemic, that's where we saw a lot of growth. Remember, business starts were up through the roof crazy um, levels. You know, they, they've subsided, but they're still at high levels in comparison to pre-pandemic. So at that time when all these startups were happening, um, also uh, we do a lot of nanny payrolls and sure payrolls. So as you can imagine, a lot of people were hiring household um, staff during the pandemic. We saw a lot of escalation in, in the very micro end of that space. I would say that's that's balanced out. It's gotten back to a more balanced uh, world. And what we saw uh, in the third quarter was was strength in the more traditional uh, traditional segments for paychecks. Great. Good to see the strong execution, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Bergen with TD Cowan. Hi, it's actually Jared Levina for Brian today. How did the 3Q PEO revenue and work site employees come in relative to your expectations? And then what is the expectation for 4Q in terms of how work site employees and at-risk health insurance revenue will compare to 3Q? Yeah, I, I uh, Jared, I, I, uh, I, I won't get into that level of granularity at this point, um, and um, so we'll we'll <clears throat> we'll report. Um, you know, as we get through uh, the uh, the quarter and uh, and year end, um, I, I'm not ready to dive into specific uh, operational metrics for the PEO at this. Uh, at this point, um, you know, we called out that that uh, revenue was going to be um, lower in Q4. That's a function of the of the topics that we've been talking about uh, relative to insurance. But um, yeah, I, I I won't go any farther than that. We'll we'll have more to say as we we get to Q4. Okay. And then in terms of that 25 to 50 basis points of potential margin expansion for FY24, can you discuss what the primary drivers of that expansion would be? Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's an emphasis that the company has had. Um, you know, we're going through the budget process, frankly, after this call is, is done. We'll start the process of putting our, our budget together, but, um we uh, we just have a mantra to get more efficient where we can get more efficient and uh, and some of it comes from uh, operations some of it comes from sales some of it comes from GNA it, it uh, it's really across the business and where we see an opportunity to uh, be, to become more efficient not simply uh, not simply just cut costs obviously that's important but also deploy technology where appropriate to become uh, better at doing what we're doing. Um, 
We do it. I, I would say that, you know, many of the technologies that you read about and that you hear, we don't trump it, but we use. And we think that advances in things like AI can be a tremendous help to tech-enabled services businesses. So we're excited about the potential, we understand the risks, uh, and, uh, and are actively looking at how we can deploy those technologies to get more efficient, get better at serving our clients. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jason Kupferberg with Bank of America. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, so I guess there's a school of thought out there. Hey, Efren. Um, there's a school of thought out there that just, you know, one of the byproducts of the banking crisis could be some tightening of credit. Small businesses find it harder to get loans. They tend to uh, bank with a lot of the regionals, et cetera. I'm just wondering what your take is on that as we start to look into fiscal 24. It doesn't sound like you guys are really assuming a recession per se in this preliminary outlook for next year. So just want to get reaction to that to start. Thanks. Yeah, Jason, I, I think I kind of mentioned it in my in my remarks and some other, other questions. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, Prime says 8% uh, for small and mid-sized business owners. And, and you talk to any regional bank that, that, I, that I've heard, and there, there's going to be some tightening of credit. That's part of the reason why we've seen a lot of our customers uh, engaging us uh, on our ERTC uh, product. So it was interesting, you know, I would say as we approach some of our clients, some of our clients were like, yeah, I really don't need that. A lot of our clients don't. What we we'll get more Main Street small business owners. They're not, they're not looking for a handout, and, and they're probably sometimes a little gun-shy to, to get out. You know, there's been a lot of talk about auditing this stuff. We had a bunch of clients come and have come back to us and, 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 and said, hey, I, I can use this money. And on average, it's $180,000 per client. So we've been doing that. We, we created partnerships with fintechs um, uh, during uh, the PPP during the pandemic, and we're also helping our clients from that perspective as well because we, we've really become a trusted source for our clients uh, to help them when they're trying to figure out how to take advantage of, of, of tax programs, of, of government programs. When you look at the PPP loans, 9% of all of the PPP loans in the U.S. was placed by paychecks. That was more than J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, you guys, combined. Um, and and so I think, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to support them and help them, and we'll continue to look for ways that we can help them um, access non-traditional uh, funding sources, um, and I think that's another part of our value proposition that our customers and our CPA partners are appreciating. Okay, understood. Um, as a follow-up, I just wanted to ask um, on the float side of things, maybe a two-parter there. The first part just being, you know, obviously the unrealized losses have increased with the rates going yep. up, but just wanted to – uh, confirm you guys can comfortably meet all the float obligations just with the short-term component. I know you said so far to date, obviously, that's been the case, but um, just wanted to make sure we shouldn't expect any material amount of realized losses. And then just any thoughts on um, FedNow coming this summer? Do you see any potential impacts on float if it's adopted by enough banks? And, and maybe just talk about how your float income breaks down between payroll and the tax pieces. Yeah, let me let me take the first part. Yeah, Jason. Obviously, when when as, as John uh, mentioned earlier in the call, when you have interest rates rising 450 basis points at the pace it did, and you're holding uh, you're holding um, very high quality uh, securities, but are are at interest rates at one one and a half, you're going to take. Uh, you're going to take. Uh, you're going to see some of the unrealized losses that. Uh, that, uh, that you see in the portfolio. We hold our securities uh, to maturity, so that really doesn't represent an issue. We've had swings from you know, plus 100 million plus now, obviously, to this, uh, to this, this uh, point. It has nothing to do with credit, so there's, there's really no issues there. Understand why you ask and understand all of the all of the concerns that others had. So those those securities will roll off the uh, off the portfolio as uh, as they uh, as they mature. Just to remind people on the call, our average duration is around three and a half uh, uh, years or so. So this is relatively uh, quick. So no issues there. 
high quality who really only invest typically in A or above uh, and, uh, and um, no concerns there. The second part of your question I didn't catch, or I, I was focusing too much on the first part, Jason. So could you <laughs> I was just it? asking, yeah, sorry, I was just asking about Fed now with those real time yeah. rails coming out this summer. Or just any thoughts on how that could, if at all, impact uh, float balances, float income? Yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. Yeah. like we'll see how many banks yeah. adopt it, right? But and then anything just on your float income, how it breaks down between the payroll and the tax pieces, because I know yeah. obviously some of the float you, you hold a lot longer. So yeah, yeah, good, good question. So so um, yeah, we've been we've been anticipating that at some point, uh, what you know the, the current landscape of payments certainly ACH windows, which promote, provide some uh, some measure of the float that we have, is going to narrow. But you, uh, of course. You know the business very well. A lot of our a lot of our float income is not coming necessarily from overnight payroll. It's coming from um, taxes, and uh, that should not be impacted significantly um, uh, under the uh, the Fed rules. The other part that I would say and flip around there is that we stopped, and there's not been a lot of conversations really as much lately about real-time payments. We do think that there will be opportunities in the future, and that may be an opportunity to monetize even if you lose some element of the float income. Final point, just uh, advertorial, uh, since this is my my 12th year now, as you know, Jason, um, (laughs) there was a point when our our business was heavily dependent on float, 27% or so of net income. We're in a different world right now. We'll, we'll manage through it, even if it doesn't materialize quite the way we, we expect it to, to. But that, that's, uh, that's a breakdown of the three pieces that I think will, will impact us going into the future. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kartik Mehta with North Coast Research. Hey, good morning, John and Efren. Efren, I, I wanted to go back – to your comment on management solutions, uh, payroll, and pricing. Do you think it's fair to assume that considering the inflationary environment we're in, and obviously that's impacting your costs as well, that the pricing on the payroll side will be higher than normal, maybe not as high as it was last year, but higher than normal? So uh, uh, I'll turn over to for John some comments on on pricing because I think that's – I think we need to distinguish between pure pricing and, and value delivered to customers. So, um, but, but let me answer your question. So, um, as you know, Cardic and, and everyone on the call knows, we typically have said that pricing is, is in the 2 to 4% range on a realized basis. So, uh, I meaning it could be a little bit higher for some clients, but frequently or, or sometimes it's discounted. Um, I don't want to talk too much to the specifics around uh, around pricing um, next year. I, I think the pricing in, environment will uh, will not be quite the same as it was this year. I think it's somewhat of an unusual situation given uh, given inflation. Having said that, I just want to want to limit that comment to the issue of pricing and let and not. Uh, not include value. I do think there's always an opportunity to think about how to add more value to a customer and then charge them for that because they're they're willing to accept it. I'll I'll let John comment on on some of the things that we think about in that respect. Yeah, I I, I think, Cardiff, we certainly don't want to talk about future pricing um, uh, on this call, but uh, I think it's fair to say that we have gotten far more scientific and precise about the ability and willingness of our customer base to pay based upon a series of attributes about the way that they consume our services, the way they want to be served, and what products that if we attach, we see better stickiness um, and, and price elasticity. So a lot of AI, a lot of data science, a lot of modeling for us to be very uh, precise in that regard. And then as Ephraim said, I think we try to talk a lot more about value and about how we engage them in the utilization of our products and services. Um, we, we approached 
over for the first time in third quarter over a hundred million mobile um, uses interactions with our Paychex Flex uh, product, and, and a vast majority of those are employees engaging the product. Um, and, and we've been doing a lot to really introduce that to that, not only our clients but their employees. But now they're getting accustomed to the notification, the way paychecks, the way they can make changes uh, in, in real time. And what we're seeing is people that we can do that with actually see that as a higher value. And you can, as you can imagine, it's a higher, uh, it's a better customer experience. And there's also um, some service uh, margin benefit there at the same time. So that's been another lever that we understand as well that we're that we're pushing on. So I think what you're going to see is us continue to understand um, what things we need to engage the customer around. That if we engage them on those items, it's going to increase the value they get from paychecks, and because of our competitive position, allow us to um, I think generate more value uh, to the bottom line at the same time. Fair. Hey, and then uh, just. Uh We've talked a lot about, obviously, PEO and ASO, and I'm just wondering if you could give a little bit of uh, context as to revenue per client, PEO versus ASO. Yeah, I, I, I'd say, uh, Kurt, um the way to think about it is um, ASO, ASO does not, in general, um, include um, – uh, include insurances, and so what you end up getting um, beyond a little bit of price on on PEO uh, on the on the base uh, product is the added um, uh, the added revenue that comes from uh, benefit attachment, typically workers' comp and also healthcare. Not all clients take healthcare, but when they do, then then the uh, the revenue can be significantly higher. Perfect. Thanks, Efren. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Keene with Deutsche Bank. Good morning. Um, just a clarification on the preliminary uh, outlook for fiscal year 24. It doesn't sound like you expect a U.S. recession in that in the, that guidance. Is that correct? And I guess if we do see a, a U.S. recession. How would it show up in the numbers, Efren, because there's definitely a lag impact to, yep. you know, yep. to where it shows up in the actual financials? Yeah. So, Brian, that's a good point. And obviously, you know, we, we all hear the, the same chatter everyone is, is hearing. So let, let me just give um, an answer to that that's a little bit more nuanced. At this point, I can only tell you what we see right now. And I can say, as we said, uh, as we repeated earlier, we see signs of moderation that we've been seeing, frankly, since the fall after Q1. Um, but we don't see any significant signs of slowing. So we just got through the last three months. John gave an overview of kind of what was happening from the selling season. That would have been to us signal that, hey, maybe something's going on here that we needed to pay attention to. Um, and uh, and incorporate. At this point, through the selling season, we haven't seen signs of a slowdown. Uh, again, have seen signs of moderation, um, and um, we've incorporated that in in our thinking. To the extent that we we saw a slowdown, obviously we we see it by by July, and we've incorporated that in our thinking. We come back and say, guess what things are slowing down. Don't think that things will, will occur that way, but um, but it could. The, the, the way we think about the year is really, and I've said this probably for the last three or four years, is in two halves. So I think that our, our confidence in terms of what we expect to see in the first half is at this stage decent. And what I mean by decent, I mean we've got enough trending to say, Something should not fall off the uh, off the cliff in the first half of the year. The Fed has tightened. John said, uh, you know, our clients are going to be much more impacted by raises, um, increases in the prime rate than anything else. 
And at this point, they seem to be absorbing where we're at and seems to be absorbing a higher rate environment. And the other thing uh, that uh, that uh, I would say is that our thought process is that we're getting close to peak short-term rates. So if we if we put that all of those factors into the gumbo and then stir it up a bit and see what our view is of first half and look at the micro factors in the business, strength in retirement services, strength in, in HR, um, we're, we're seeing a good progress on, on HCM, and then a rebound in PEO, it produces the results we have. Now, um, the nuance that I would provide to that is that that takes us through, as you know, the, the end of November, that's the first half, uh, we'll come up for air and see if that the trends that we expected to occur um, in the back half of the year actually materialize. At this point, it's a little tough to call that nine months out, but uh, that's why we label it preliminary. Uh, right now, the point, though, Brian, after I said all of those words, is simply to say at this point, we don't have anything in our data that's suggesting to us that a slowdown is occurring or is imminent. Um, now, uh, if the Fed were to decide that it needs to go back to a cycle of 50 basis point increase rates, we're going to have a different conversation really quick. Don't see that happening. Uh, and one final point, you know, all of us on the call were wondering two or three weeks ago, were we going to have a systemic banking crisis on our hands? And we certainly were. We're looking at that and concerned about it. It seems like the economy was resilient enough and the Fed did. Uh, I should say, Treasury did, did the right things in terms of shoring up the banking system. So we're we're uh, we're we have the environment we have. We understand what factors are moderating. We think that what this outlook um, uh, incorporates is our best thinking on on the environment. Um, and I think that uh, that uh, having said that, our confidence in the second half. Uh, obviously, will will uh, will be something that we'll uh, we'll talk of, about talk more about as we go through the year. Yeah, I, Got Brian, it. I would. Yeah, Brian, I, and I just I just point you point you to our Paychex IHS job index report uh, on our website, and look at January and look at February. We release it every month. Both months, the job index improved. We didn't see that in any other consecutive months in the prior fiscal year. So, you know, certainly we don't see, as Efren already said, I'm not going to reiterate what Efren said, but even the, ex, the, the, the benchmarks that we would see that would be signs, we've been doing this, we've been doing this for a while. Um, and we have a lot of the historical models of what it looks like leading into recession. And we're just not, not seeing those. And what we hear from our clients in terms of the labor market, in terms of their employment, again, moderation, Stabilization. Uh, they're not signing up for any big, any big pieces. And I and I understand the the, the the challenge. And I try to put it in perspective of saying, how can you hear all this on the TV and in the, in the newspapers of what's happening, and then rationalize that with what I I walk into the office and hear every day. And I, and I do think in some respects, I, I said a, I said it in earlier comments, and it's the only way I've rationalized it is, you know, we. we there's two different small business worlds, um, and I think there's a lot of money poured into a lot of tech companies, a lot of people that didn't have to make money, could spend money, could pay whatever they needed to, could hire as many people even if they didn't have stuff for them to do. I think that bubble is bursting, and you're seeing that being digested. I don't see the foundation of Main Street small business at this point Um having those same type of dynamics that you're reading in the paper. I just simply can't put it any other way, but we're just not seeing it in numbers. Now, is there going to be a trickle down? And, and certainly the banking thing last week was certainly concerning because that gets contagious. Uh, hopefully the policymakers and individuals can do things to continue to help support Main Street small businesses um, from being impacted to the, uh, being impacted from those kind of um, irrational um, actors uh, that are that are doing things that don't make sense. But I'll get off that soapbox. No, that was great. Super helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Peter Christensen with City. 
Uh, good morning, John Efren. How are you? Good. Uh, good. Good. Um, just, just wondering if we can get a sense for that the health of of the top of the funnel. If we were to exclude the the ERTC side of things, um, what are you seeing from you know I know new, new business formation and uh, also um, uh, perhaps some share shift from regional cell filers, that kind of stuff would be helpful color there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, Peter, uh, again, I'll go back. What we see is on, on business applications, business starts, uh, again, are they're back to pre-pandemic level. So I always, always try to explain to people that you look, when I look at it, at five, because we're doing our budget plan, so I'm looking back, you know, for almost five fiscal years now, and, and fiscal year 19 stands out at me because then you see all this oddity going on in, in the other fiscal years. You know, business starts are down from where they were historically, and and that's why when I even look at some of our, you know, uh, uh, retention in the in the small end, that doesn't surprise me because even in good times or, or bad times, a small business that starts two years later, most of them aren't in business. So when I look at it, there's a good there's good stable uh, new business starts. Um, when I looked at ourselves for the third quarter, they were strong. Um, across the board, not just in ERTC, but across the board. Um, and so I, I really, again, I'll go back. I'm not seeing anything on a macro level that would ind- indicate to me that there are macro issues or there are demand issues relative to the product and services that we're offering. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Pete. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Marcon with Baird. Hey, good morning, uh, John and Efren. A couple Very of morning. questions. One is basically, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, the margin guide, um, you know, or the preliminary thoughts with regards to margins for next year, you know, to what extent um, would you expect to see any sort of improvement in terms of the margins, X, the impact of, of float income, and, uh, and how are you thinking about that? That's a good, good question. Um, Mark, I, I – I um, I don't think float will play as big an impact on margin expansion as it did this year. Um, I will hold the answer to that question until I've gone through the budget process because it will depend on where I end up in terms of float income for next year. We anticipate that it will grow, so that will have a, a modest impact on the uh, on the um, uh, on the, it will exert um, a positive impact on margin um, next year. But remember, Mark, one other thing is that we called out ERTC as moderating. That's going to exert a countervailing force. So uh, when I when I pull those two together, uh, I'll figure it out and answer on uh, on Q4. But I I don't think uh, I think there will be. Uh, at the end of the day, likely um, real uh, real improvement in operating margin when all is said and done. You you think there will or will not be? Will will will. That's my okay. expectation. But I haven't gone okay. through it all. So, so but X quote, uh, we should see some margin improvement, and then I would, and then. And then with regards to, you know, I know you're in the budget process now, but are you anticipating, you know, an increase in terms of the sales force, um, you know, and in terms of the overall headcount within the business, or are the technological, um, you know, innovations that you're making, you know, sufficient to, to basically, um, you know, continue to drive the business with the same headcount? Yeah, good, good question. I'll answer it in two ways, and then let, let John uh, give, give his commentary, because I am sure he will be scrutinizing every headcount in the sales budget. But, but the short answer is that that where Mark, where where it makes sense to add headcount to drive greater sales, um, we are likely to do that, and I'll, I'll, I'll let John talk to that. But I think you rightly identify something that uh, has been a feature of the company, which is increasingly, uh, if you look at not only in the U.S., but also in Europe, where we also have a growing business, 
a lot of our sales are done digitally and do not require uh, at least at a minimum the level of sales involvement that uh, that our field sales force uh, provides. So you're going to have a mix, uh, and I don't think that we know quite yet whether there are ads, but I would be careful because I know our competitors tout their uh, tout their headcount ads as a precursor or a driver of growth. That is not necessarily where where we are at. We can grow without adding headcount, although there are places where we, we may choose to do that. I'll let John talk to that issue. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't tout adding expense to the business uh, very frequently. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, that you know, we're constantly looking to make sure that we have the right uh, go-to-market strategies and the right go-to-market coverage. We are certainly focused on using um, our vast data sets and analytics and digital engagement as much as we can. As, as Ephraim said, I went back five years ago. You know, our digital, um, our digital. If you think about just in the U.S., I mean, including international, Paychecks.com and, and SurePayroll.com, you know, probably a 20 uh, point improvement uh, in in the percent, 20 percentage point improvement in what we're getting there. We're driving analytics to make our sales force more um, productive. So instead of just cold calling across the, the, the market or inside our client base, we're using data analytics and models and triggers of behaviors of people engaging our systems to give them um, active, uh, active lists. So I think there's opportunity for productivity. And we're doing a lot more digital engagement in, inside our uh, applications. Um, and, and actually creating digital experiences to, to drive more attachment of ancillary uh, products and services. So I think when we're sitting down for the budget, we're certainly going to add sales reps, uh, engaging our strategic partners, doing things that we need to do um, to cover the market and the market opportunity we have, but we're equally balanced on making sure we're making the investments in digital engagement and driving productivity and using um, the, the data analytics we have to make sure we're, we're, we're making every rep as productive as they can be. Fantastic. And then one last one. Um, did you say what your – how much pays per control ended up increasing over the course of this of this quarter or this year on a year-over-year basis? Um, I've got some investors that, you know, are under the impression that your, your pays per control might be up by 300 bips, and then they're – factoring in the ERTC and looking at, you know, the underlying growth. And, um, you know, I'm not sure that the, the, the numbers are right. So just yeah. what what did you see in terms of pays per control for this last quarter? So uh, we didn't talk about it, um, but I will say this. Through, through, the, uh, through the year, we have seen increases in, in, uh, in pays per control, or we would say, uh, checks uh, and it's moderated as we've gone through the year. So that, uh, uh, in some ways, it's been a tale of two cities. The first half is, is going to end up being different than the second half of the year. Yeah. And, and again, just, 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 just keep in mind. Remember where Main Street small business was a year ago in terms of their ability to hire people. They were they were yeah. understaffed, desperate to get people. So we, you got the benefit of that hiring up. It's not that there's a there's a deceleration. It's, it took them. It, it, this has been an interesting year in terms of people getting and us helping them getting staffed up. Now they're staffed up. I'm not expecting that they're going to add another, you know, a big group of employees, um, regardless of whether or not there was a recession or not. Right? I mean, they're fully staffed, and we would expect a, a moderation of, of the growth in, in the number of employees in our uh, in our clients. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eugene Samuni with Moffitt Nathanson. Thank you, guys. Hi, uh, John and Afghan. Thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, sure. I just have one quick question. wanted to follow sure. up on the comment, John, you made on Secure X 2.0. Always very interesting to hear about how kind of regulatory developments can help you guys. So can you elaborate a bit? specifically on what the opportunity for paychecks might be from that act, and then what is the time frame for when we might see that flow into your into your financial results? Yeah, yeah. So we, as we said, we're in our budget, and we're really in our, in, our, in our planning stages to figure out how we want to approach the SECURE Act, act 2 
we started some education, certainly within our base, and we're trying to figure out and scope the size of the opportunity um, across the market and determine what investment we're going to do that. And that's something I think we'll talk about more in the next in, in the next call. We're doing a lot of surveys, trying to get where people are in their understanding of what it means. There's a huge education effort that I think has to go on, but I think it's a pretty powerful value proposition. Like I said, I think this secular labor problem is going to continue. Um, I don't, even when we go through a recession, we just simply don't have enough people working. The labor participation rate is just not big enough to meet even a lower demand. Um, we're at 3. Point, what, 3.4, 3.5 unemployment. Um, and, and so I think the, the simple fact is small and mid-sized businesses needing to compete against large employers who typically have richer benefit plans is going to be a secular um, trend that's going to continue, and I think we're well positioned to do that. And I, and I say that because that's going to create the opportunity for a 401K plan. And the SECURE Act 2.0, just to give you an idea, Pretty much if you're a, an employer with between 20 and 50 employees, um, we could provide you and start up in a, a 401k plan, and you would pay paychecks literally nothing because you would net. You'd pay us for a startup fee. You'd pay us for the, um, the other fees that we would have there, but you'd get all that back through tax credit. So it's basically you can add the plan. And then if you want to contribute up to $1,000, to each employee, you can get that $1,000 as a, as a tax credit as well in many circumstances. So, there, you know, I think there's not a lot of awareness. Look, we found the same thing with ERTC. There are just a lot of small, mid-sized, small, mid-sized business owners not even aware these programs exist. And then they have reluctance to participate because whether we want to like it or not, they have some skepticism about government programs and being on some government list. And, and we're really positioning ourselves as kind of this trusted advisor um, to help them and help facilitate that. And so we're, we're doing a lot of studies on it. We're trying to figure out how big the opportunity is. Um, and, and certainly we think it's, it's a great thing for small and mid-sized businesses. And, again, I, I applaud uh, uh, the Congress and, and, and all the partisanship that goes on in Washington. It's great to see them have a program like this, and I hope there's more programs like this in the years that come to support uh, Main Street uh, small business owners. Got it. Thank you. That's all I have. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from James Fawcett with Morgan Stanley. Hey, thank you very much, John Efren, for all the detail yep. and, and color. Um, just a, a couple of, of questions from me. Um, first, and I know we've talked a little bit about this both, um, in previous quarters, but now, but can you recap for us a little bit be, why do you think ERTC outperformed what you thought it would do during the course of this fiscal year, and then kind of how that contributes to, to you thinking that it, it could slow a little bit in, in next? Uh, look, I'll just uh, start. John, John can take from here. Yeah, yeah James, I, I think that um, – when we when we entered the year, we thought that there was widespread understanding and knowledge of the program, such that as we went further and further into the base, uh, clients will would have already availed themselves of the service. What we actually found was that they were anxious to hear and to be educated with respect to the program and the way it worked and our ability to facilitate their access to the program made them constructive about um, about wanting to participate. The level of uh, the level of understanding was lower than we anticipated. John talked about that for many reasons, and it, it turned out that there was a much bigger opportunity uh, coming into this year than, than we had realized. As we get into next year, more and more time, has elapsed, so the, the ability to access uh, the programs is running out. One, it, it relates to a period of time that now will, will have been uh, 18, 24 months ago. And so as we round the next year into, uh, into the beginning of calendar 
uh, 24, we think that the opportunity both within our base and in general um, uh, will have moderated. So the back half of the year, we don't anticipate that there will be as much demand or opportunity. And, and, and one answer. Yeah, no, I, again, I just read, I think this is a good example of, of how we're trying to approach uh, helping our clients. I think when the program was first announced, we did a lot with PP, with the PPP loan program. I talked about that, 9% of all of them, uh, we paired with FinTech companies to be able to facilitate that. And we really developed a muscle there to build an automated simple solution and a educational package and program for both our strategic partner CPAs and for our clients to go through. When the ERTC program came out, I think we thought they kind of knew about it and were just trying to do general education. I think what we learned early on is that was just not resonating. And a lot of people either thought they didn't qualify or weren't sure, or quite frankly, by some of the just hassles and other challenges of uh, participating in to some other government programs, they felt like, hey, I don't need this right now, and I just, I just can't, I can't tolerate. I think we had two things kind of happen. One is our data science uh, team began to look at actual data models, and we started to be able to pinpoint accuracy, be able to go to a client and say, we actually know from our data that you qualify, and this is how much we're talking about. So now you're saying, hey, I can get you a check for $180,000. And what you had to do with education, there was some more information, and then we made it a very simple process. So one was we were now, instead of broadcasting to all of our clients, we were going with a specific database analysis to a specific client and saying, we have a high degree of confidence that you spend 10 minutes with us and we get a few pieces of information we're going to be able to get you a check that would be meaningful and worth your time. That's one. Then we had to overcome all the obstacles. I think simultaneously to that, interest rates started to go up, and the cost of capital started to go up. And I think a lot of small business owners who said, it, hey, I don't need it. It's not worth my time. I don't want to be associated with a government program. I may get audited. And, and you know, most, most business owners, small business owners are concerned an audit would put them out of business. Uh, worse than anything else. So they, I think they were avoiding it. I think as we saw that happening, now the receptivity and the demand that said, hey, I really need that $180,000 uh, to bridge inflation, to be able to, to bridge uh, the cost of capital um, to grow my business. And so I think we had those two things, us being more precise in terms of our messaging and, and getting our sales and our education teams out there. And then second, I think there were some macro pressures on small business owners uh, that created that, um, that, that tailwind that exceed what we expected. That's, that's really helpful, Color. And then just last thing for me is, um, you know, Efren, is you talked about that at least at the initial planning stages, you think margins uh, next year can expand some. Um, you mm-hmm. know, if I, if I reflect back on, on where you've talked about your, you know, margin targets in the past, we were kind of getting towards the upper end of that. Yes. Is, are we at a stage we can start contemplating that that maybe um, the the margin structure can even move above where you talked about in the past, or what would have to happen for that to be the case? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question, Jim. So, um, and that's the benefit of listening to what I've said over a period of time. You know, if you would have said to me persistently we could be above forty percent. I would have uh, urged caution because I didn't know whether whether we had all of the set of initiatives that that could drive us there. Um, the the short answer to that is I don't have a great answer. I, I have a sense of of when uh, when uh, we're probably getting closer to the ceiling. I do think that you're right in saying that it's been reset a bit, and it's been reset a bit because of technology. So technology keeps giving us opportunities to automate things that we, if you would have said seven years ago, is that a chat bot could be as good or better than a human answering 275 questions that are 90% of what clients want to know. I would have said, I don't know about that. And the short answer now is that number is not 275. It's probably 375 or 400 questions. So Short answer is technology is going to set the limit, um, especially in the tech services business, 
And so I think we, we probably have developed some more headroom with some of the actions that we have taken. And it's not just it's not just pure technology, but I think we've learned to become more automated efficiently. A lot of the initiatives that John started years ago have, have paid uh, have paid these dividends. That's great. Hey, thank you very much for, for all the input, John and Efren. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question will come from Andrew Polkowitz with J.P. Morgan. Hey, John and Efren, thanks for sitting in. Hey, um, just wanted to, just, hey guys, um, just wanted to ask. You mentioned earlier that it was a highly competitive selling season, so I just wanted to ask um, what, if you could share where that competition is coming from, whether it's newer entrants, usual suspects like the regionals, um, and if there is anything to call out different from history regarding balance of trade. Um, I, I wouldn't say uh, any new entrants. It's the same. It's the same suspects. I, I think uh, you know. I think what we found was uh, just just everyone was more aggressive in trying to go after and, and, and grab market share. And I'm very proud of our sales team um, for for really out competing. My, our, our, the competitive metrics were very strong um, for the quarter. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, in a very aggressive market, and I would say every one of our market segments um, uh, saw that, and, and I think that's going to continue. Look, I think uh, I'm very proud of where we are and where we're positioned. Um, I'm sure uh, a lot of our smaller competitors and those that are maybe, you know, a little more focused in niches that aren't doing as well um, as, the, as, as the traditional small business market is doing, uh, we'll, we'll maybe get more aggressive, but I, I feel good about where our value proposition is. And I think what we're finding is, as I said, I think our strategic partners, our clients, um, and and I think prospects are beginning to put a premium on, hey, I want to be somewhere where they you know what they're doing, they're doing it right, um, and they're stable, and they're going to be able to have the, the financial capability to continue to invest in their products and services over the long term. And so um, I, I think uh, I think there may be a little less uh, chasing uh, shiny objects uh, as we go forward. So, Got it. Thank you. And I said one quick follow-up on op margins. I mean, for the quarter, this quarter, it came out a little bit ahead of the 44 to 43% you laid out three months ago. Just wanted to ask if there is anything that came out um, better than you expected three months ago relating the expense line. Well, I think, I think uh, you know, revenue obviously was a little bit higher than we expected. A lot of the flow through um, then drove uh, higher margins, and our expenses were in line with uh, maybe a little bit better than, than we anticipated. The combination of that is really what drove uh, better margin performance in the quarter. Great. Thanks, and congrats again. Yep, thanks. Thank you. And at this time, I have no further questions in queue. I'll turn the call back over to John Gibson for any additional or closing remarks. Well, thank you uh, very much, Todd. I appreciate it. Um, at this point, we'll close the call. Uh, if you're interested in a replay of the web, uh, webcast, uh, it'll be archived for approximately nine days on our website. I want to thank everybody for your interest in paychecks, and I hope everybody has a great day. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at any time.